Man, what's up, church? Good morning. Uh, I'm so happy that we get to gather this morning. I wish I could see you. I wish we were gathered together. Um, I'm thankful that we're still continuing to press in to see what God is going to do in our community in this time. Um, I want to take a few minutes on that note, kind of just to talk about, I think the the lingering question right now for all of us is, when are we going to get back in the building? When are we going to gather? And what I just want to lay before you is the reality that I'm a pastor. I'm a pastor. Okay, so I like, I, I'm I'm learning about this book. I'm, I'm listening to Jesus. I'm trying to teach you about these things. I am not an epidemiologist. I'm not. I'm not. A, I'm not involved in the healthcare field at all. I'm not really politically involved at all. I don't. I don't understand what's happening at this great level. I'm not an expert in these things. And so, actually, what I've done is I've asked a committee of people who do, who are doctors, nurses, people who are involved in school, um, parents, and different people. They are going to form a committee, and they're going to decide and help us uh, implement and get back into the building. And what I what I've said is that um, I want to I want to be aggressive in the time in which we get back to gathering. So I don't want to wait. I think there's a felt need right now in all people to really get back to this kind of human interaction. So I want to be aggressive. I want to get back together quickly. But that being said, I want to get back together responsibly. And so I think to be aggressive, we're going to have to take greater precautions and greater measures so that we can get back and we can be safe. We can make sure the most vulnerable populations of our church are safe. And so just know that, that there's a committee that's going to decide that. It's going to be driven by medical, people who are involved in the medical field, people who are involved in education, in the political arenas. We, all, we have all those people in our body and they're going to help drive that decision. They're going to decide what's going to be safe and wise uh, because just like um, when we kind of started first going to this, first going to church at home, we weren't driven by fear. And so we're not going to be driven by fear and reopening. We weren't rushed and we're not going to be rushed to make this decision now. We're going to do something that's responsible and effective and in the right time that we are going to prayerfully consider and be led to say, okay, God, what do you want for our community here? Good Shepherd in Loveland. And so I uh, just want to, I think that's on the front of all of our minds and certainly on the front of my mind. When are we going to get back in the building? And I just, we will have more information forthcoming. Check your inbox, check the midweek update. Uh, as soon as we have it, we'll get it to you for sure. Cause we are, like I said, we're excited. I fully expect that when we get back to normal, you all want to be there. We're all going to gather together again. We might not hug like we used to, we might not high five like we used to, we might have some masks on. I don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but uh, we're going to get back together soon because I think we're all missing it. So uh, that being said, uh, we are kicking off a new series today. And so today we're going to kick off a series uh, for I don't really know how many weeks this is going to go, but we're just going to walk through the book of Ephesians. And so the book of Ephesians is probably one of my favorite books of the Bible, if not my favorite book of the Bible. It is. Uh, it was the very first series I ever did in student ministry. Was I just I didn't really I didn't have an outline, I didn't have a template, I didn't know what we we're going to do, and I said, listen, we're just going to get in Scripture, we're just going to read through Ephesians. And what I love about just taking a big block of scripture like that at a time and just going through it all at once is, is you sort of just get like this steady dose of reality of who God is. And you, you take these big chunks of uh, digesting what he wants to communicate to us through his word. And, and what I like, even on my side of things as your pastor, is it doesn't let me pick and choose topically what we are going to cover. Because I think even right now in this season, like, the natural tendency in my mind is like, oh, we probably need to talk about fear. We need to talk about how you overcome fear. We need to talk about how you have hope uh, in a time of chaos and crisis. We need to talk about how you be the church, the hands and feet. And there's all these different topics my mind wants to go to. But what I love about just going through a book is it, it doesn't allow me to just pick and choose topically what we're in. Instead, what we do is we just get a steady dose of who Jesus is and what he's done. And we're going to ask ourselves, how does that affect and how do I apply those realities to my life? And so that being said, too, if there's there's going to be tougher topics, like even in Ephesians, there's some there's maybe some harder questions, some tougher topics. But I don't get to I don't get to skirt any different tough topics when we're just going through a book. So we're just going to go through Ephesians. I don't know how many weeks we're going to be in it. And actually today we're not even going to look at any verses in the book of Ephesians. That's what's kind of crazy. What I want to do today is I want to kind of lay some fundamental framework on this book that I hope kind of puts some parameters and guides us as we go through this series over the next several weeks. Because the cool thing about the book of, of Ephesians is, maybe you don't know, it's, it was a letter written by the Apostle Paul to not just one church, but actually to a, a network of churches in this town called Ephesus. Ephesus would have been in modern day Turkey, and it was this great like business capital. I mean, there was it was a huge hub of just 
population, entertainment and business and commerce. And, and um, th there's plenty more cultural context things that we'll unpack in several weeks to come. But what I find interesting about it is that it's really like a fascinating case study for a church. Uh, because we see actually in the book of Acts, we see that Paul plants the church in Ephesus. So we see this church being planted. We see it being encouraged when Paul writes to them in his letter to the Ephesian church, the Ephesians, what we're going to be reading. But then it's also pastored by the apostle John. It's uh, one of its elders and pastors. That word can kind of be used interchangeably um, is Timothy. So they have John and they have Timothy on staff. So if that doesn't make like me feel inferior as a staff person, like it's like, they had like a varsity level staff running this thing. But then we, so we see its birth, we see its encouragement, we see kind of who's running it. And then we also see it rebuked then in the book of Revelation. And so I think you just have this fascinating, there's no other church in the New Testament that's written to or written about more than the church in Ephesus. And so I think it's a great case study for us right now. Um, but the reality is, and what we're gonna look at today is that what my hope for this, for this sermon today is the parameter that we would put on the rest of this series going forward is we would see that um, the Bible, when we come to it, we're going to be coming to it to learn who Jesus is. But we don't just, our goal is not just to, to retain all that knowledge so that we just can accumulate facts about him, but so that that knowledge would then be applied so that we look more like him. And so that's kind of, you'll see this in, in Revelation as we get there today. But I just want to like lay that down. That's where we're going for the rest of the day is that there, there's something that you can do when you just come at scripture. If you're just trying to come at this and maybe some of you, like maybe that's why you have a hard time with Bible reading. Maybe you were, to, if you were really honest, you'd say, you know, honestly, like it's just pretty dry for me. Like I, I don't get that much out of reading our Bible. I've certainly been in that spot in my life before, but but I think one of the things that we get wrong is we think that, oh, I just, I need to learn more about Jesus. And we look at it as this kind of task to do. Um, but re what we miss when we do that, the reality that like, no, this is actually a start. It's to inform us of who Jesus is. And so, yes, I come to it to learn about him. But the reason I'm coming to learn about him is so that my love for him can be incited all the more. It's like getting to know different things about your spouse that you just will unpack and learn more of as you go. And hopefully those things are not just a bunch of facts that you accumulate. So I don't just, when I talk about my wife, Katie, I don't just kind of rattle off a bunch of facts about her, but you actually, I, I, I learn more about her. I want to spend time with her. I want to talk with her because that helps me love her all the more. It presses me and it, it brings my heart an expression of joy out of my heart in my love towards her. And so that's what we're hoping to do today. So Revelation chapter two, if you want to turn there in your Bible, if I'm going too quick, you can, you know, you can hit pause, but Revelation chapter two, um, it starts like this. It says to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Just for time's sake, it's Jesus. That's Jesus. These are Jesus's words to the church in Ephesus. He says, I know your works your toil and your patient endurance and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but you've tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake and you have not grown weary. So the first few verses I'm thinking about if this church exists in America today, sign me up. Like I'll go, I mean, pastored by John and Timothy planted by Paul, that they are able to test out different people who are calling themselves apostles and they know how to test doctrine. They, that means they're in the Bible studies. They know what's true. They know what's wrong. They don't, they don't tolerate any false teaching. They don't grow weary in doing good. They're pressing in. They're patiently enduring. Like, I'm like, that's a church today. Sign me up. I think that looks good on the outside for a lot of us, but then it pivots here. And Jesus says, but I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Repent. I'll remove my lampstand. I'll remove my presence. I'll remove the light that I've put in you. The, the reason you're so pivotal, you're so influential in the world is because I've given you this lampstand. I've put the light of the world. I've entrusted it to you. And I'm going to take that away if you don't turn back to the things you did at first. And so before we turn back and ask, okay, what were the things they did at first? I just, I need you all to ponder. I need us all to ponder the reality that there is a way that you can patiently endure. 
There's a way that you can understand the, the, the stories in the Bible. You can know what the Bible says. You can memorize scripture. You can, you can know what it means. You can, you can have a, just a firm grip on what's true. You can do all these Christian practices and you can be missing something. It's like you can have all these things in your life, but you can be missing the love that God put in you at first. And I think that's so important because there, there's, it's so easy to slide in the spot where it's like, oh, I think I'm better than, or I have all this religious, religious pride can kind of creep in because we know all the stories, we know all the facts. And so we think that has somehow made us better, but it's not about just this vain like pursuit of theology. That theology needs to lead us back to worship. It, need to, it needs to lead us back to inside our hearts to something. It's not just so that we would accumulate all these facts and learn all these things. It needs to point us somewhere. And that point needs to be for greater affection, greater love for Jesus. That's the point. That's the whole point of the sermon, like I was just saying. But I think it is good if we look back, like I said, we get to actually look back and see what were the things that the Ephesian church did at first? What were those things that the things that Jesus is saying, don't neglect them, don't turn back, get back to what you were doing at first. And so we can turn all the way back to the book of Acts. Book of Acts chapter 19 is where we'll be. And like, there's some crazy things happening in Acts. I'd encourage you if you have some time this week, go back and read some of these stories. But what happens in Acts 19 is, is Paul meets some of the believers that are in Ephesus and he's encouraging them and he's discipling them. And, and he, he's asking them, okay, man, have you, what, what baptism did you receive? And they're like, well, we received John's baptism of repentance. And he's like, what about the Holy Spirit? They're like, the who? And so like, there's just so many questions there. Where I'm just like, how is a group of believers just missing the reality of the Holy Spirit? But then they, they catch the ghost, they catch the Holy Spirit. He starts getting in, involved in their lives and they just like commit themselves to Paul's teaching. And it says they met in the temple for a couple years. They were just meeting and pressing in and they were growing, they were learning all these things. There's just crazy stuff happening in Paul's life. This is where it talks about in Acts 19 where they were just taking like the handkerchiefs and the old clothes that Paul was wearing and they're using those things to go cast out demons and to heal people in Jesus' name. And so like, there's some space in my brain where I'm just like, I don't even know categorically where to put that. That like that guy was moving in such anointing. He was moving with such gifting that they were just taking his old laundry. And they were using that to go. There was enough residual on that to go do powerful things in Jesus name. And then you move through the seven sons of Sceva story, which is an awesome story. It's probably one of my favorite stories. I just don't have the time right now to go through it, but check that out. Read it all in Acts 19. After the seven sons of Sceva, after this incident where this demon possessed man beats up a bunch of guys, it says here in verse 17, and this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks and fear fell upon them all. And the name, and the name of the Lord was extolled. So the first thing they did was they extolled the name of the Lord. That was the first thing that the Ephesian church did at first that they had lost sight of. They, they extolled Jesus' name. What's, uh, extol means to praise, but it doesn't just mean to praise. It means to praise enthusiastically. So, so to praise is just to have a position in our hearts that overflows out of us in some form of expression. And so like I think of... Uh, my, my daughter right now, she's two, Haven. And when you, when you ask her if she wants to go watch Forky on TV, she literally like, she like can't control her energy. And she's just like, yes, Forky, like, yes, Forky, let's go. And there's this, there's this thing that's incited in her that overflows into expression into the real world that we can all see. And, and so like, there's that, there, Harrison sitting at the dinner table the other night, out of nowhere, just kind of starts singing, God is so awesome. And he's so mighty. And it's, and it's praise. And it's just this like pure position of his heart that overflows. And, and sometimes it can be profound. Like we sang songs just this morning that were profound. They had deep, profound truth in them. They can be, they can be poetic. Like David writes, uh, so a deer pants for the water, so my soul thirsts for you, so my soul longs for you. And so there's like some poetry in there and it's beautiful and it's artistic and it's creative, but it can also be just like pitchy. Like it, it doesn't have to sound good, but it doesn't matter. Like it just, what matters is that praise ends up being a position of your heart that overflows into some form of expression. And a lot of times it's verbal. And so it's singing and it's, it's singing together with people and it's celebrating and it's rejoicing, but it all looks a certain way. You see, because I think what we've kind of done as modern day Christians at times is, is I can go, okay, I know what praise looks like in church. 
I know what praise looks like in church. And, and okay, I get together with all my people and we sing and it's great. And we lift up the name of the Lord and we sing to him and we minister to him. And that's praise there. And then we, can, and we know enough maybe to say, well, praise isn't just that. Praise is also just like it's a way that we live our life in our quiet time. And so do you, do you personally have this like kind of personal private time where you praise the Lord and you, and you minister to him? You, you, you kind of ascribe his worth to him. You tell him who he is. You, you tell him your affections for him. But I think one of the things we've lost is this ability to praise in public spaces where we just, our faith is so on display at Walmart or just at the gym, wherever we go, like, where do we go now? I think I'm trying to think in my mind, it's like, no, we'd really just go to Walmart. Like you just go to the grocery store. But as you're going about through your day, are you praising the Lord? Like, would somebody else know just, just the way that like, sometimes when I'm walking through Walmart, I might hold my wife's hand. I might show my affection for her just as we're doing something mundane publicly, but publicly, would anyone ever know that you're a Christian? Because are you ever, ascri- like, are you ever expressing that love to him? And, and so I don't know exactly what that looks like for you, but like, it's just a question to ponder. Do you praise the Lord publicly at any space throughout your day? And the word isn't just praise here. Like I said, it's extolled, which means to be praising like with gusto, to be praising enthusiastically. And so you have to understand there's something happening here in this, fo- these, this group of followers in Ephesus where they're so, they're so thrilled about who the Lord is that they've committed themselves to teaching every day. It actually says, if you back up a little bit in Acts 19, it says that everyone in Asia had heard the truth about the way. Think about like that, to me, that's a crazy sentence. Like everybody in all of Asia had heard. It doesn't say that everyone believed, but everyone had heard. And I just gotta think there's a connection here between the fact that they were extolling the name of the Lord, they are praising him so enthusiastically, they weren't just doing it privately in their home, they weren't just doing it when they were gathered in the temple, they were extolling the name of the Lord so that every single person who lived in this entire gigantic region heard the good news about Jesus. So the first thing they did, the, the thing that Jesus is saying, get back to what you did at first, they extolled the name of the Lord, they praised him, they worshiped him, The second thing it says in verse 18, it says, also many of those who are now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. And so here's what I got to just imagine happened is like they caught the Holy Ghost. Man, they, they they got serious about teaching. They were worshiping the Lord. They were praising him, lifting his name up. And then they just started dumping all of their past stuff on each other. And so here's what this looked like, like really practically. Like, so if you haven't ever been to our church, you come visit us on a Sunday morning. This is not a public thing that we do. I don't, I don't, we don't pass the microphone around and say, okay, now it's the time of the service where everyone's going to confess and divulge their practices to one another. But the way that we've interpreted this, the way that we think this works best is through small groups, through groups like smaller relationships where you might say, hey, listen, this is my opportunity. I can't do this necessarily on a Sunday morning when I'm gathered with hundreds of people, but I can when I'm in my living room. I can just take my mask off. I can unveil who I really am. I can be authentic with somebody and say, here's all the crazy stuff that I have going on in my life. Here's the mistakes I've made. Would you help me be accountable? And you can check in with people and you can just finally, maybe with a small group of people for the first time, be real about who you really are. Like, I just think it's so vital. It's so pivotal for you to to experience and walk in this abundant life that Jesus calls you in. I think you have to, at some point, be able to step into and embrace who you really are. And the reality is, is like, for this to happen well in a church, and what I'm so thankful happens well at Good Shepherd Church, is that for somebody to be open about who they really are, they need to encounter people who are real with who they really are, and they have experienced the reality of God's grace. Because if I'm going to confess who I am to you and you think that, oh, I'm just some, you know, like I never really made that many mistakes in my life. Like I, I've memorized a lot of scripture. I show up at church every Sunday and you kind of, there's a way that the church can be hypocritical, right? And we can have all these self-righteous things that we build up in ourselves. But my experience in any church I've ever been in, honestly, and especially in our church, is that when I've confessed who I really am, it's always met with a oh my gosh, you know what? I've struggled with some of that stuff too. Like I've been in that same place. And, and you encounter people who have encountered the grace of God. And because they've encountered the grace of God, they can then extend that to you. So I think it's important for all of us who call Good Shepherd home right now, like it's important that we understand that we have no reason to boast about who we are in Christ. It's been his gracious gift bestowed, his righteousness bestowed upon us. And that's the only reason that we don't have any of our sin to worry about. And that's the reason that anyone else's story, whenever they start to share it with me, it's not going to scare me. 
It doesn't matter what kind of sin you've caught yourself up in. It doesn't matter what, what you've done. You can't scare me because I've, I recognize the inexhaustible well of grace that Jesus has poured out to me. And so now I can easily pour that out to other people. And so that's how confessing and divulging your practices works. It only works well if you have a community of people who embrace the reality of God's grace given to them first, and they're able to give that out to other people. But I think it's important. It's an important step in your life to find people, find someone you can trust, be open and honest about who you really are so that you can walk in genuine love for one another and so that you can embrace the reality that God has been gracious and loving to you as well. That's what I just, I know you'll meet it if you, if you do. And if you've one time, I can imagine like some people probably hear this and they go, man, that one time though, I really, I told that person who I was and they really let me down. And, and I'm sorry that that happened to you. I hope that doesn't hinder you from stepping into it again, because I think the most life-giving form of relationship is one where the other person across the coffee table, across the living room from you, they know everything about who you really are and they still choose to love you. That's the most open, honest, loving relationship you can be in is where you have no secrets, you're totally open with somebody and they still love you. They still wanna be in relationship with you. So the early believers in Ephesus, man, they, they extolled the name of the Lord, they confessed, divulged practices, they, they praised the Lord, they were open and honest with each other about who they really were. And the last thing it says, it says that, uh, and a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So a lot of the believers early on, they, had, they were kind of mixed up in some of the cultish things that were going on in Ephesus. And they took sin so seriously that they came and they burned all of their stuff, even though it was worth a ton of money. They probably could have sold it, probably could have held on to some of it, but instead they took the serious step of burning it. And so the last thing that the Ephesian church did was they took sin seriously. They took sin seriously. They, and, and I just want to like invite you right now. I think right now you maybe have that sin. And I think there's maybe even like kind of uh, uh, a part of our minds that thinks we can keep sin at like kind of this safe distance, right? We can socially distance ourselves from sin that we have in our life. And we can, we can put a mask on and we can wash our hands. And we, we're aware that it's still there, but we kind of keep it at arm's length. We keep it six feet away, like it's the appropriate distance away. But the Bible says that sin, when it's fully grown, it's going to bring death. And so there's no pet sin that you have. And maybe you're convinced that you have the power to control it. You have the power to control what you're looking at, what, what you're gossiping about, the little lies that you're telling. It's not a big deal right now and I have it under control. Like it's all good. But the reality is, is we have to take sin seriously because sin's desire is to, is to master us. And when it is fully grown, it will bring death. And so what they did here, man, they just, they burned everything. And I think now's the time for you to take that dramatic step with the sin that you have in your life. Maybe it is time to, to, to get rid of that app on your phone, to finally get that accountability partner. And just be honest, you say like, hey, here are the things that I'm lying about. Here's what I need you to check on. Here's the times I'm getting in trouble. You call me here. We got to put some things in practice. Take the dramatic step to say, I'm not tolerating this anymore. Because I know the reality is that you think you have it beat, but then I know for some of you too, you, you actually have a sin that you want to beat. You want to get on top of this and you want to get rid of it. And it just keeps clawing its way back into your life. And I just wonder if the reason that, that sin keeps having little victories in your life is because you haven't taken the dramatic step to get rid of it. So just, just get rid of whatever it is. If you have to get rid of that, if you have to get rid of that contact in your phone, if you have to get rid of that app on your phone, if you have to do something dramatic, tell somebody, hey, this is what I'm gossiping about. I'm actually gossiping with you a lot. And I want, I want to invite you into this process so that you and I don't get in this trouble together because I'm trying to take this dramatic step to get rid of the sin in my life. I think it's, I think that's so pivotal that we as a church don't try and tolerate or sort of enable these sort of pet sins that we think are fine because we keep them at a at an appropriate distance the reality is that sin desires to to get us and it will bring death so the last verse i think is so encouraging in acts um, in this story it says so the word of the lord continued to increase and prevail mightily so the Ephesian church, they did these few things. They, they praised the name of the Lord. They were open and honest with one another. They took their sins seriously. And, and as a result of that, the word of the Lord in a region began to increase and prevail mightily. And so what happens after this, if you go read the story on your own, uh, there's a riot that breaks out because there's this silversmith who has no more business to be made in making silver idols. 
you see things like the church is having such a profound impact on what they're doing. So many people are turning to Jesus that all these people who were, uh, that there's a whole economy built out on these production and building of false idols and that, that economy is collapsing. So I mean, you could import that into so many evil areas in our world today where if, what if the church increased and prevailed so mightily that all of these all of these evil practices, like there just wasn't work to be had in anymore. There wasn't things to do because people aren't watching that anymore. People aren't participating in this anymore. And so you would see all these evil economies crumble because the word of the Lord is increasing and prevailing mightily. And I just like, I think the temptation here is to go like, okay, yeah, like let's, as a church, let's like go out, let's not tolerate this sin. Let's not tolerate this thing. Let's go protest. And, and the reality is, is that that's not what the church in Ephesus did. I'm not knocking people who want to go out and protest. I'm just saying that's not what they did here. What they did here was they came to the Lord. They, they came and did the hard work of getting themselves right first. And, and, and they were so transformed. They were praising the name of the Lord. They were open and honest. They were growing. They were, they were taking sin seriously. So they weren't looking like the same person. That's what made the difference out in the world. It wasn't the church going, hey, world, you need to stop looking a certain way. It was people going, I can't look that way anymore. I need to set my face upon the Lord. I'm in love with him. I want to grow with him. I'm not just going to settle for cold, stuffy theology. I'm going to let that theology be rich and be like a log that incites this flame of worship on my heart. And I'm going to come to him. And so when the church came and when the church got serious about these things, when the church did the hard inward work of acknowledging who they really were, taking their sins seriously, kicking rid of it, that's when their influence, that's when their, their ability to penetrate society was at its strongest. I'm not saying there isn't a time to call sin out when you see things that are wrong that are happening in the world. I'm not saying there's a time where we shouldn't go protest. I'm saying the reality is, is I think a lot of times that activity is easier than doing the hard inward activity in our own personal hearts. So I just want to invite us all, and I want to invite you really like, I think this series through the book of Ephesians, the book of Ephesians really breaks down into two categories. And for the first little bit, we're going to look at who Jesus is and what he's done for us personally. And then at, at about midway through the book, it pivots to saying, how do we see those realities play out in our lives? I just want to invite you to come along with us. Maybe you're part of our household, uh, maybe our, our family of faith, and maybe you're not. I just want to invite you to participate with us over these next few weeks. Um, hopefully, we'll be back to gathering in person soon. But either way, we're going to be going through this book. I want to invite you, all of our people who call Good Shepherd home right now, um, and even if, not, if you're just going to commit to this journey, I want to invite you, read the first 14 verses of Ephesians chapter 1. You could read all of chapter one if you want, but I think next week is we're going to look at that first 14 verses. And so I want you just to read through it, read through it slowly, read through it multiple times, make some questions, underline some things, and we'll be in talking about that next week. But the journey here is not just so that we might accumulate a bunch of head knowledge. It's not so that we might just puff ourselves up. It's so that we might really consider the truth, the reality of who Christ is and what he's done. We're going to let his word do the hard inward work in our hearts so that we might actually have influence and effectiveness in the world around us. So come back next week. I can't wait. I hope uh, you'll be a part of it soon. I can't wait. I hope we get together soon. I'm going to pray and then uh, we'll be done. So pray with me. Lord Jesus, we love you. And I, I pray for anyone watching this right now, God, that you would, that you would just continually um, stir our hearts to desire the things of you so that we might look more like you, God. I just pray that we would be a house that is known for our ability to praise you. Praise you in the middle of what's happening right now and in these difficult seasons, God. But would we also praise you when things are all back to normal? Would our praise for you be steady? Would it be loud? Would it be heard? Would it be felt by the world, God, that we would extol your name, not in some fake way, but we would just like lift up the name of Jesus because we're so aware of what you've done for us personally, God. Would we would we build and, and would you knit together just wonderful, deep, rich relationships where people can be authentic, people can be real, where we would spur each other on so that we might grow and get better, God. And would you help us just take sin seriously? God, I pray for that person right now who's listening to this and they know exactly what it is. They know exactly what pet sin, they know exactly what little thing they have in their life that they're convinced they have control of or they're either or they're highly aware of the fact that they have no control over this sin right now, God. Would you, would you help them take it seriously? 
Would you help them put that desire, put that thing to death? And would you then um, show them that you want to put a new kind of life on them? And would you empower them and sustain them in your grace to have victory over that sin, over that behavior, whatever it is, God? I just I lift them up. I pray for them, God. I pray that we would all take it seriously. And Jesus, I pray that uh, you would just continue to be near to us, continue to do something great in us, God. Um, I pray for the virus, that things would continue to go in the right direction. I pray against any sort of resurgence or any of this coming back. I just ask that we would um, be able to press back into what life could look like on the other side of this, Jesus. We um, we love you and we trust you. No matter how long this season's going to last, we're in it and we're in it and we're going to see what you're going to do in us right now. So we just... Uh, we're thankful for you and we're in love with you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.